Okay, so our uh, invited speaker for today is um, Titus Brown. And Titus is joining us from yes, uh, Michigan State uh, University. Where he has been since 2008. Um, prior to that, he did his studies at Caltech. And uh, what I find interesting about Titus is that he combines great research with great openness uh, and has a, has a wonderful philosophy uh, for sharing science and promoting uh, good science and good techniques, um, particularly in environmentalists, to all. Um, if you haven't checked out Titus Brown, he has a great blog as well where he has been critiquing his six year old daughter and her scientific experimental process. Uh, but uh, we're going to hear today about uh, Building Humor, a platform for research and scale of sequence analysis. So, welcome. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I've actually been here since Sunday. So, I got to see the weather on Monday. So, I don't <laughs> think Toronto is just a cold, rainy place. Um, I think it's also a warm, sun, somewhat warm, sunny place on occasion. <laughs> So, um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, a variety of different topics. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to take a page from Fernando Perez's talk at PyCon, where he, uh, he basically talked about his IPython notebook software, and, and after about a 10 minute introduction, he just had slide after slide after slide of all the stuff that's going on. I don't have that much stuff going on, so it's only the last like five slides of my talk, but um, because there's a lot of things going on in, in, with our research, I wanted to sort of give you a taste of of what we're doing and how um, some of our approaches have enabled that in the hopes of convincing you that these approaches are, are worth taking in your own, in your own research. Um, so uh, first let me just say hi. Uh, so at Michigan State I'm a, a system professor now in microbiology and in computer science. Um, I'm also part of a, a center for the study of evolution and action. Um, and you can find all sorts of information about me, a sort of unintentional consequence of having done, of having posted almost everything I do for the last 15 years is that if you Google me, I think there's several hundred thousand hits. Uh, and these sites, you can find anything about me on these, virtually anything about me on these sites, but that doesn't mean you can find any one thing about me. So it's sort of a little bit of an information deluge uh, problem. But my blog and my Twitter information is right, right there. So um, I'm going to start by introducing Cambers. And I, I don't know how, how bioinformatics y or how the brain graph y this audience is. So I apologize if you've seen this a million times before. but but our software really has been focused on, on one thing only, which is looking at KMERS. And so KMERS is a very um, uh, uh, increasingly common concept in bioinformatics now, where you take a, a read, generally an Illumina read in our, in our case, um, and you break it down into uh, overlapping words of a fixed length. So in this case, uh, K would be 10, I think. Yep. Uh, the read would be, I don't know, something like um, 20 bases in length. Uh, and uh, we break that down into about 10 different cameras overlapping uh, 10, 10 bases in length of each. Um, and uh, <coughs> something that I'm, I'm throwing against the wall to see what Jared thinks about it is this concept that uh, cameras give you sort of an implicit alignment. If you take two reads and you, and you line them up based on which cameras they share, uh, here you can see uh, that we have two reads, say, and they overlap in the regions that they're, they're aligned to, and that's an exact overlap. So it's a very stringent alignment. Uh, and you can calculate these kinds of things very, very easily with KMERS because you can, if doing exact comparisons is sort of a trivial computer <coughs> science problem, right? Difficult, it, it becomes difficult when you need to do intels and, and insertions and deletions or um, uh, uh, mismatches, but as long as you're okay with exact matches, then aligning two, aligning two sequences is, is trivial, right? The problem comes in when you have to deal with uh, uh, places where the sequences don't match. But as long as they match, you're good. So it turns out that um, KMERS and these De Bruyne graph approaches and, and uh, uh, really a lot of the, the, out the heuristics that Blast and Blatt use, for example, where they insist on core matches that are good and long, um, uh, all deal with a sort of implicit, very hard, very high stringency alignment concept. Um, and there's a reason I mention this, and I'll get to it later on in the, in the, in the talk. Um, so this is the basic concept of KMERS. And uh, a very common approach to assembly these days, or at least it has been for the last 10 years, I think it's starting to die out as longer reads come along, but is to use um, an older approach, I guess, is De Bruyne graphs, where what you do is you basically take your sequences, you break them down into KMERS, and then you rebuild uh, longer sequences by walking from KMER to KMER to KMER. So just take a little bit of time to do that. If you have two six base pair sequences, 
KACCGG and CCGGTT, and you break them down into formers, and you connect the formers by, by uh, uh, overlaps at th of three bases. You have AACC, which overlaps with ACCG, CCG overlaps with CCG, CGG overlaps with CGG, and then so on. Then you can actually construct the alignment by the assembly of these two sequences simply by walking from camera to camera. This is the, the, the concept at the heart of, of De Bruyne graph assemblers, like Velvet and um, Abyss and uh, Soap so De Novo and, and other such. So um, the problem with camers is, is the flip side of their convenience. It's very easy to calculate identity between camers. This camera and this camera, they're identical. We're going to match the sequence at that point. But as soon as you have a sequencing error, everything goes to hell. And here, uh, we have these same two reads as before, but I've introduced a C instead of a G at the right spot. Generally, as you may know, reads don't come with their errors helpfully highlighted in red. But in the case where we know what they are, you can say, OK, uh, if, we're, if we're breaking each of these sequences down into, um, into 10 MERS, uh, there will actually be 10 novel KMERS in the second sequence as, opposed to, as compared to the first sequence, just as a result of the sequencing error. Not, not anything biological, right? It's just that that red, uh, that red um, uh, base appears in 10 different camers that, that are not in the first sequence. And so you get this inflation of, of apparent, this apparent inflation of data because you're breaking everything down into camers and you're insisting on these exact matches and these errors in, in the sequencing inflate that number of, of those number of camers. So in particular, what this means, this is a very nice uh, uh, paper by Conway and Broma showing, pointing out that assembly graphs, that is when you load all your, your read data into an uh, assembly graph and you, you want to you compute an assembly, that, that, that when you're using De Bruyne graphs, those assembly graphs scale with the data size, not with the information that's there. So if you're sequencing, say, a, um, a single genome, you have some finite number of true edges in the, in, in the assembly graph representing the genome, right? At some point, you've, you've sequenced the genome to a thousand X coverage, there's no more information coming out of the genome and making its way into your data set. You already have it all in the data set. You've saturated your, your sort of true information. But because of each additional error in the reads gives you an additional set of k-mers, gives you additional edges in this graph, um, you end up with uh, the number of error edges continuing to increase more or less linearly with the number of reads. And this is why, uh, for RNA-seq and for metagenomes in particular, um, memory consumption of assemblers is such a problem. You need to sequence very deeply to see the rare things in in both RNA-seq and in both transcriptomes and metagenomes. In order to sequence deeply, you need lots of reads, and that ends up giving you a lot of total edges, most of which are error edges, even if you contain most of the, the true information. Is this a, I can't tell if, if everybody's sort of, it's, it's late, it's the end of the term, you've given up on science. Wait, it's also <laughs> true for, let's say, cancer genomes, where you have lots of cellularity issues and right. so forth, right? Right, so, so if you're dealing with, uh, I mean, Metagenomes and cancer or genomes are essentially the have same. many things in common. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, so uh, if you're sequencing any mixture, to the, okay. the, the rarest uh, element component of that mixture is going to be that you can observe is going to be limited by the amount of sequencing you do, because um, uh, uh, if you have a one in one hundred uh, mutation in the human genome that you're sequencing in a mixture that you're sequencing, you need to sequence probably a thousand x to really reliably see that. So, these, so this is actually where, the, this is the motivation for all of the scaling work we've done. That you need to sequence very deeply to see things, rare things, reliably. So um, where this becomes really annoyingly practical uh, is that um, if you're doing things like soil, soil sequencing, which is where I got started, or uh, you can apply this for mRNA-seq data as well, and you actually measure how much memory your, um, your programs are using, uh, what you find is that the effective memory usage of, say, Velvet, in this case, uh, grows more or less linearly with the amount of data you have. That wouldn't necessarily be a problem if the numbers over here were, say, megabytes of memory. But the numbers over here are gigabytes of memory, and this is in about, it is about 80 million reads. So for 80 million reads of soil metagenome, we are consuming over 110 gigabytes of, of system memory. And of course, you can actually generate now billions and billions of metagenome reads quite easily which means that you need uh, terabytes and terabytes of main system memory. And it turns out most computers don't have terabytes and terabytes of system memory. So we were very quickly, this, uh, this was done a couple of years back, we were very quickly running out of essentially, um, uh, out of memory that you could acquire on any reasonable computer. I mean, we're talking computers that would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and there's only two or three of. 
and we could we could swamp them with about ten thousand dollars worth of Illumina uh, sequencing. So this is this is the problem that we set out to to address. Um, so a lot of our technology is based on a very uh, on one concept. I'd like to call it a simple concept. I've just spent three days at a teaching workshop where we've been told not to use words like just and simple because it. When people don't understand it in the audience, then it, they feel dumb. And, and it's a simple concept because I've spent the last six years of my life thinking about it. So uh, for that version of simple, this is a simple concept. It's at least a single concept, which is that if you can count these k-mers efficiently in main memory, then you can do wonderful things. And so this is a graph that I didn't massage appropriately for this talk, uh, because um, showing that um, the growth for our software, which is called khmer, uh, the growth in memory usage with number of distinct cameras in the data set. If all you want to do is count cameras, you want to count how many times have I seen this particular word. I've seen it once, I've seen it 10 times, I've seen it 50 times. This is a problem that underlies a lot of assembly and quality filtering approaches. Then uh, um, you want to be able to do so efficiently, and we've developed some software that lets us do so efficiently, do so fairly efficiently, in the face of billions of distinct cameras. So here, for example, we have 2 billion cameras, and we can uh, keep track of all those in about seven or eight gigabytes of memory, depending on certain parameters that you feed into our software. And this capability alone, the, the capability of counting cameras this efficiently, uh, has given us a lot of, of, of future abilities, which is what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk right, talking about. And this work is, um, is to some extent published. Uh, we have a preprint problem. I tend to write papers, put them on a preprint server, start watching them get cited, and then stop caring about getting them past peer review, which is a a pathology I'm working on um, because it turns out my tenure and review committees do in fact care about peer review publication, even if my users don't. But anyway, so uh, the, the fundamental concept uh, that's a part of this is that if you have a sparse collection of cameras for a large case, say 20 or 30, in any given data set, very few of those cameras will actually be present in the data set. And so you can adopt probabilistic uh, approaches, bloom filters in this case, or count min sketches that let you represent the space of those cameras very efficiently. Uh, and here, this is from our 2012 paper showing that um, our approaches in terms of number of bits of memory needed per camer uh, for a large range of total number of camers uh, are much more, are considerably more efficient than any possible exact encoding based on information theoretic calculations. So in other words, uh, any exact data structure that's used that's not for a bloom filter or, or um, uh, anything you would care to name, uh, uh, hash table uh, or uh, suffix tree is necessarily consumes more memory than our approaches for a wide range of a wide range of, of, of camera numbers. And that's been published. And how to talk more about it. So starting from these humble beginnings, and, and I actually have a little anecdote, so I don't think I've ever told Jared this. So um, in 2008 or 2009, we I wrote a blog post, a long blog post about this concept. It was about like it was like five or six page long blog post. I was like, hey, we just discovered this really neat thing. If we don't care about collision tracking and hash tables, we can store cameras really efficiently. And it's really cool. And here are all the implications of this. And we can use this to count cameras, and it's super awesome. And I posted it. It was, I think it was my first like academic, like my research blog post from my lab. And a day or two later on Twitter, I saw this tweet from some guy saying, Hey, look at this blog post with blog posts like this, who needs papers anymore? And it was from Jared. Um, and I had no idea who Jared was. I was like, cool, somebody likes this. And then I Googled his name, and I was like, oh, this guy wrote like three assemblers. Yeah. Hmm. Wait a sec, if I can get his attention by writing blog posts, this is a better way of publishing. So anyway, so uh, that was one of the things that sort of convinced me very early on that continuing to do this would bring me attention, hopefully positive attention. Um, uh, and so far it has, but that's a, that's a different story. So, okay, so, so we have this efficient online counting of cameras, and uh, we've had that for about five or six years, and from this sort of basic concept of if we can count cameras efficiently, we can do many wonderful things, um, we've developed approaches for trimming reads on abundance, which turns out to be a very good way of um, trimming reads on camera abundance, which turns out to be a very effective at error correction, or error, error trimming, I should say. We've developed an efficient De Bruyne graph uh, representation that is um, considerably better than uh, um, any of the existing De Bruyne graph representations, and people have actually built off of that to build even better De Bruyne graph representations than ours. Uh, if you've heard of the Minia assembler, um, that's that's based loose, loosely on our work uh, and is really cool. 
Um, and then we've also developed something that has really transformed the way we've been thinking about research going forward, which is read abundance normalization. And this is digital normalization for those of you that, that may have run across that term. Um, okay, this leads to good things. And, and we published some data structures and algorithms papers. So uh, um, the top paper is one that's uh, hopefully we're sending back for, for re-review shortly and should be accepted. Um, uh, the challenge for this paper, um, camera counting, was can we get a Star Wars reference into the published literature? So these are not the cameras you are looking for. It's on our probabilistic camera counting software. Um, we just, uh, so far the reviewers haven't said anything. So I suppose if you can get it past peer review, it's, it's good. It's good, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> scaling metagenome sequence assembly with probabilistic de Bruyne graphs. So with PNAS, I'm not quite as playful with the titles because they take themselves a little more seriously than plus one. Uh, and then um, another paper that actually is, uh, we continue, continues to be out there and cited and that I actually haven't resubmitted for two years now. It's our digital normalization paper. Um, uh, um, and this is on the, the algorithm that I talked about for normalization. So this is one component of our research, which is really the, the, the component that's going to get me tenure, frankly, which is, um, I don't have it yet, so I shouldn't be too confident about it. But that if I get tenure, it will be because I have senior author papers on this stuff. right? These are novel data structures and algorithms. Computer scientists can look at them and go, oh, you did something novel. That's great. Um, but I'm also uh, I'm probably more proud of these papers, which are data analysis papers. So we've been able to take these data structures and algorithms and apply them to data sets that nobody else could analyze and produce results from those data sets. Not necessarily terribly biologically meaningful results. So our soil assembly paper, which just came out in PNAS, basically concluded with, yes, you can sequence soil, but you actually need like 10 to 100 times more sequence which is not really the strongest conclusion, but needed to make it into the literature. Um, we're doing some great stuff with uh, um, uh, novel obsidian genomes and transcriptomes. My graduate student started intending to sequence two transcriptomes and is now up to three transcriptomes and three genomes, just a progression of Illumina sequencing. And then we actually have an 85 tissue lamprey transcriptome composed of uh, being built for about five billion different reads uh, that uh, we're hopefully going to be sending out soon. Um, well, it's basically sequence every part of the library we could get at. And you guys are a Great Lakes associated city, obviously. Uh, library is a big problem in the Great Lakes, as you may, may or may not know. So that's why we've been studying. So those are the papers I'm excited about. Uh, I'm more excited about. And I should say, somewhat unintentionally, our lab approach has, has uh, evolved into the situation where we're developing novel data structures and algorithms. Then we're implementing them at scale. And then we're applying them to real biological um, problems. And I think it would, be cra would have been crazy for me to go into the faculty position thinking that this is what I was going to do, but this is what it turns out we need, right? We need novel data structures and algorithms. We have big data problems, so they need to be implemented at scale. And then it turns out that, that we, we, um, people have real pressing biological data analysis problems, so we're, we're sort of running the whole gamut. Okay, so this leads to good things. We have our software, which implements all of these things. And these are all more or less published, or at least old hat. So what we've actually been doing is uh, pressing forward with abandon, by which I mean all of the gray things are, are things that graduate students in my lab are actually working on. I don't actually have that many graduate students, so uh, I think some of them are doubling up. Um, actually, some of them have been poached by Google, so they're no longer working on those things. But, so our current research actually uh, covers a much larger swath of sequence analysis now. So we're doing things like um, efficient search for target genes, so we can take um, uh, one of my students was doing a uh, targeted search for 16S in, in soil metagenomes to, to do non-amplicon, you know, pull out non, pull out community structure without using amplicon sequencing. And he found that our software was faster for pulling those reads out than any of the, the special purpose software that had been written. Totally, totally at random. Kind of nice. We have HMM guided assembly where you can give us a protein, um, a profile in markup model for a protein sequence. We can walk the De Bruyne graph and pull out protein sequences uh, from the underlying DNA reads that, that match that, that make, that encode that, a protein that matches that profile in the markup model. We have approaches for further partitioning data sets. We take very large data sets and break them down in various ways based on graph connectivity. Um, we have ways of labeling billions of nodes, graphs with billions of nodes and, and, and investigating those different, uh, the different subsets. So if you know about color to brain graph and variant calling kind of thing we're exploring there. Cloud assembly protocols, the other three things on the, on the right are things I'm going to talk about in a second. So, so we have our, our software that we've sort of written and published on, and we have all of this current research going on, and it's all using the same software. How is this possible? So I don't know how many of you, raise your hand if you develop software. How many of you? Okay, right. 
So if you're in a software, if, if you're in a software lab, if you're in a lab where, where there is some software being developed, the typical approach, and this is the half-assed version, is one where, um, this is being recorded, oh well. Anyway, so uh, it's the one where <laughs> you have, um, your advisor comes into the lab, and he has some software that he worked on as a postdoc, and he says, okay, everybody in the lab is going to work on this software. The, the non, the zero R approach to this is everybody works on their own software and doesn't talk to each other, right? Let's, let's, let's assume you're all trying to build off the same set of software, which is usually some half-broken piece of software that your advisor brought with you from his postdoc. And they're all working on it, and grad student one does some research, grad student two does some research, and in the process of doing their own research, they break everything about the corpus of software, right? Because, because they're doing research, and, and research doesn't, the, the original stuff that the software did is no longer interesting. The software's been published, nobody cares about it anymore. Besides, it's on some, some FTP site somewhere, and, it, and who cares? And uh, the grad students now work more or less in isolation. Every now and then, they may find a common bug, like, oh, there's a parsing bug in the FASTA parser, so maybe you should take my code and fix that. Or they forget to mention it, and the code continues to be broken. So this would, if we were uh, following this approach, our, uh, we would not be able to do most of what we've done in, in my lab, which is build on the same set of software. So the approach we've been taking it's much more the, uh, what I'm calling a not insane way to do software development. It's based on what the open source software community does, where you have some stable version. Um, when uh, grad student one does some research, there's a bunch of tests on the stable version that you can run, and their job is not only to do novel research, but keep the original functioning of the software uh, stable. Uh, and so uh, a rule is if they want to take their research and merge it back into the stable version, the tests must pass. And I should say, um, Run tests, uh, this is a necessary component for graduating from my lab, which actually puts the motivation back in the, back in the process, right? You don't get your, you don't, I don't even let you send a paper out for publication for, for review unless it's been merged into our, our repository. Um, because I know what happens, right? I, I know how this works. Uh, okay, it's okay, I'll do it the week after I defend. <laughs> right, okay. So uh, grad student two does some research. Grad student two is responsible for making sure that the latest version merges into their repository before they merge theirs in, and at every point they run the tests. And, and I, have a, a secret, I have a secret for you, which is that uh, sometimes, just to make myself feel better, I actually run the tests on the stable version, just because I can. Right? Just, just to make sure that it hasn't deteriorated in the, in the like three nights since I last ran the test. So I'm, I'm a little, I love it. So, okay. So, so this is our not-so-secret sauce. So we have a fairly high test coverage. It's grown over time. We, um, uh, we do what we call stupidity-driven testing, uh, where we find a bug, and then we write a test, that demonstra an automated test that demonstrates the bug, and then we fix the bug. And we never run across the same bug twice. We run across new and exciting bugs. We, um, we use GitHub pull requests and continuous integration. In order to propose a merge, you have to set up a pull request. As soon as the pull request is set up, uh, another machine automatically pulls down your code and runs it and lets us know whether the test passed. And if they don't, you can't merge your code. Your code's not even set, for, set up for review. And then we also do code review. Does new code meet our minimal coding requirements? And by minimal coding requirements, I really mean like they're pretty minimal. Like there's a style guide, but there are ways of automatically reformatting the code to meet the style guide, so it's not a big deal. Um, the thing that I'm actually most excited about, because frankly some of my grad students can't spell, is we now require you to run a spell checker on your code. right? There's nothing worse than picking up a piece of code and finding that like the help message has a major misspelling right in the okay. There's probably many things worse than that. But, <laughs> but, but it frustrates me because I'm, I'm spelling sensitive. So, um, and so these things are things we all enforce. Um, and then we also do something called integration testing. And this is new. So Cage, I haven't really told you much about what it does, but we view ourselves as a filter. We take, we take read data. We do stuff to the read data. We produce better read data data that's been partitioned or normalized or error trimmed or whatever, and then we feed it into other programs. So we don't actually, we didn't actually write our own assembler. There are plenty of other people that have written assemblers, and I, for one, do not want to compete with people like Jerry. So what we do is we, we, we insert ourselves before the assembler. We make the data, we fix the data, which means that if our output breaks, the, breaks what the assembler wants to, to chew on, then our software is broken. So we actually introduced uh, 1.0, which just came out of April 1st, we actually now do um, acceptance tests. And so what we do with acceptance tests is we actually take a pipeline and we run the entire pipeline that includes KTRM, but also includes um, Trimomatic, FastQ, uh, FastX, uh, um, and Trinity, and Blast, but whatever. Uh, and uh, we check to make sure that the end results are actually decent. 
If they're not decent, we go back and we figure out why. This turns out, this detected several major bugs in our package that were caused by recent merges um, before 1.0. It also, interestingly, is a very passive aggressive approach because we're actually officially, we're essentially acceptance testing Trinity, right? Because we can now go and say, hey, your version worked with our data last month and now your latest version doesn't work with the same data that worked last month. What did you do? So stay tuned. We'll, uh, we're becoming extra passive aggressive in the future. Okay, but so, so where do these acceptance tests come from, right? Well, it turns out that, that we have a, um, another effort, which is an education effort, education and, and, and uh, reproducibility effort called KHM protocols. And the argument here is, honestly, nobody should ever have to figure out how to run an mRNA seq assembly pipeline on their own ever again, right? It's just not an interesting problem anymore, seriously, because all the software has existed for years and you just need to stitch it together and nobody should have to figure that out from scratch. So what we did was we just wrote a, a, a pipeline, a protocol as I call it, kind of like the lab protocols that you get in your mini cut kits, like I cut this into this and then you don't need to know what all of the steps do, but at least you have them all written down and then you can start tweaking them once they work. So we did this based on some summer workshops that I run uh, and realized that students would go home from those summer workshops not knowing exactly what they've done, so we started doing this and maintaining them and they're under version control and all that. And we can take these protocols um, and we can run through all the steps. So these are copy paste in the cloud protocols. So you spin up an Ubuntu machine, you install some default software, and then you have a set of things. As long as the data is in place A, you can run, uh, you can run all of these commands and the results will be placed in, 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 in location B. And we're talking about everything from read cleaning all the way through RSEM annotation and RSEM differential expression. So for de novo and more analysis. Um, and the whole thing takes about 100 bucks, 150 bucks to run. It takes about a week on an Amazon rental computer, which means you can go from about $1,000 to $2,000 worth of mRNA seq data all the way to a finished result in about a week for about 100, 150 bucks on a computer that anybody can rent with a credit card, which I view as a win. Um, and of course, these things are on GitHub, they're open, they're under CC0, they're versioned, they're citable and you can fork them and do whatever you want with them. I don't, as long as you don't talk to me about it, you can do whatever you want with them. As soon as you talk to me about it, then you're engaging my like, time and attention and I don't want to do it anyway. So why is, this, why is this cool? We've also added literate testing onto this. And what literate testing does is it goes through the protocols, pulls out all of the commands in the protocols, and runs them in shell scripts. So our protocols that are tutorials for other people to execute can also be automatically executed by us whenever we feel like it. And these double now as our acceptance tests. Can we run the protocols on real data uh, and, and get the right results? Um, and this actually tremendously improves our peace of mind because it means that we're not dependent on, we don't have to do much manual stuff to test to see if our software works with the latest version of Terminomatic FastX and Trinity. Just run it all. And if it works, like, well, good. It's, it's all written down in the tutorial. Other people can run it. We're all, you know, everything's copacetic. Um, okay, so this has then led in further fun directions, which is that we now have these protocols in English for running analyses in the cloud. They're actually nice tutorials if you're, like, if you're interested in de novo assembly. Uh, they're useful for education. We've also added this literate testing component where they get extracted into shell scripts. And now we're expanding in three different ways. We have them you know, used as acceptance tests on our software. Does our software work within the ecosystem bioinformatics software? We can also use them for benchmarking, which I'll get to in a second. And something that's particularly, right, I told you I was going to get more passive aggressive, we can also use them for tool competitions. I get, I estimate between 40 and 80% new assembly papers come across my desk now for review. Because there's only like, now that with open review, with open peer review, where people are signing their peer reviews, I now know everybody who, who, who reviews assembly papers. And there's only like eight of us. Uh, and I'm, I'm completely serious, but this isn't a joke. Like, it's the same people reviewing. <laughs> almost all the transcriptome and metagenome assembly papers, because there's only so many of us that are willing, that are professors and willing to do the review. So next time those papers come across my desk, what I'm gonna do is take my protocol, swap out the assembler, run their new assembler on it, and do a tool comparison. And my review will include what ha a comparison on my own data for what their assembler does. And I'm actually gearing up to do it for about 100 data sets automatically. So that when a new mRNA sequence assembler comes out and they've cherry picked their beautiful data set from their particular sequencer and animal, and they've said, hey, our assembler works better on this than anybody else's, which is a very common thing in the bioinformatics world, we can actually test it on 100 different data sets and give them some statistics. Um, we haven't done that yet. I'm kind of interested to see how the editors respond to that. But anyway, so we can do this for tool competitions. We can do benchmarking. And uh, it's actually really, it's been really a lot of fun. 
So for benchmarking, um, I have PyCon 2014, which is up in Montreal. This is my second visit to Canada in three, in three weeks. Yeah. Uh, um, we, uh, I ran our entire protocol on an Amazon machine and then um, instrumented the machine to track memory, disk usage, and CPU. And so CPU is up at the top here, CPU load, RAM is here, and disk is here, thousands of transactions per second. And you can see this is the quality filtering stage, this is the digital normalization stage, this is the assembly stage of Trinity, this is the annotation stage of Blast, and this is the R SAM of, I think, eight different samples. And so what you can see is different parts of the pipeline use different portions of the computer differently, right? Uh, assembly is very CPU intensive and somewhat memory intensive. Um, RSEM, it does a lot of mapping, it's very disk intensive. Uh, DigiNorm is very memory intensive, the way we've configured it for this, and, and so on and so forth. So this is cool because you can actually start to do things like optimize which machines you're going to pick for which stage based on, on how they work. Uh, but it's all completely automated to do this. Um, and so we've been focusing on real pipelines where it takes 40 hours to go for a real published data set to go from zero to an assembly. Uh, it takes about 40 hours, uh, which is about uh, 80, 50 bucks on, a, on an Amazon machine. And so we can, we can just do this automatically now for these protocols. And, and we can actually detect performance regressions. So I really like these, these graphs, because they're, uh, we can now do things like write grants saying, hey, if you think a thousand people are running this assembler a year, you know, that's how much it will cost for you to buy the machines for those people to do it. If you give us the money instead, it'll be half the price. I, I, we'll see how well that works, but, but that's my strategy. So, so in terms of current research there, right, so we have all the sort of cool technology stuff, which, which I, I think um, many researchers are sort of unimpressed with because they, don't, they have one data set to analyze and all they want is that analysis to be finished and then move on. Um, we also have all this other research that I want to just briefly touch on. So well, one thing that I'm really excited about uh, that's, that's started to come to fruition is <coughs> this question of, um, of doing comparisons between short read data sets. So if you do metagenomics, and this gets to be true for human, for host associated, or for uh, viral, or for um, environmental. You end up with a pile of reads, right? You, you sequence a bunch of, of, of Illumina. You sequence a bunch of Illumina. Uh, you get a couple hundred million billion reads from something that you scooped out of the ocean or the soil or somebody's poo or whatever. And then uh, you run it through an assembler, and you discover that the assembler discards all your strain variants and does horrible things to your abundances and doesn't really represent your data. For soil, it's been particularly annoying because we don't have enough data to actually assemble. You need a high coverage data in order to, to get assemblies from environmental genomes. So we've developed an approach based on um, shared KMERS in effect, but it's, it's, um, it's actually shared components of the De Bruyne graph, where we can look at reads that are from the IO corn and look for, for an IO corn sample, for example, and look at their coverage in another sample. And so what you can see here is there's actually an astonishingly large amount it ends up being about 50% of the data set in practice, where the data has some component that's both in Iowa Perry and Iowa Corn. That is, there are shared genomic intervals between two different environmental meta metagenomes. Um, and so we're developing ways to do this. It's, it's extremely efficient, both memory efficient and time efficient to do this comparison. So we're developing distance-based metrics to do, um, to do uh, sample clustering. So we can say this sample and this sample, based on the components of the De Bruyne graph that are shared, are much more similar than these other samples. Uh, and we're also um, thinking about how to do co-assembly and end-weight comparisons and, and pick out high abundance components. There's none in soil, but you can imagine high abundance components in one or the other or both that we can pick out and assemble separately, partitioning based on abundance. So these are all approaches that have been sort of done in a somewhat ad hoc way, and we're really trying to put them on a, on a, on a more fundamental algorithmic. And it's all assembly-free. This is done to the raw reads, not to the, not to the um, context. Another thing that I've been talking about now for two years uh, Jared saw this slide a year and a half ago in England, um, uh, is to do error correction via graph alignment. So what, what we want to do is take reads, take those reads and align them to the De Bruyne graph, allowing in insertions, deletions, and mismatches. And essentially we can do this by walking the graph and just doing a, essentially a dynamic programming alignment. It's actually a, a, a pair H and M alignment. But, and the only reason this hasn't gone further is that Jason um, got his PhD uh, and left the lab for Amazon like a week later. And Jordan was in the middle of his project and Google reached into my lab and offered him a job making like twice as much as I do. So he left. And now I have a third graduate student who's presumably getting hit by a bus next week uh, working on the same project. I should, he, he's, he's good. He went to industry and came back to academia. So I have hopes. He knows what he's into. 
And so what we've been able to do with this is um, essentially take a graph-based approach, rather than a camera-based approach or, any, or a reference-based approach, we can take a graph-based approach to looking at the reads and correcting them both for indels and mismatches um, uh, for a sort of raw read data sets very efficiently. So we can do this in one pass or 1.2 pass of the data set, which is pretty good. Uh, well, I'm sorry, this is actually two pass and 1.2 pass. Um, uh, and, and basically what we're doing is we're going through the reads and we're figuring out where the reads have a mismatch in the graph and then we're correcting them if there's sufficient evidence that mismatch is um, not appropriate. Uh, and so uh, um, the two numbers to pay attention to here are, for example, the number of false positives. These are the number out of all of the different, uh, out of all of the different errors in the um, data set. Uh, we're correcting eight. We're we're falsely correcting. We're creating eight thousand mistakes, and we're missing correcting ninety-eight thousand. But we're correcting three point four million correctly. I don't know if that makes sense. So we're taking a read, and we're either correcting it correctly, correcting it incorrectly, or failing to correct it. And and this is a this is an initial approach. So so we still have a, a, a ways to go for optimizing it. But um, our goal is to get this number as close to zero as possible, so that we're not falsely correcting. Almost all these reads, by the way, are from repeat regions, so it's not clear that falsely correcting them is a problem because you're just making things look like repeat regions, but it's, it's, it's a, it would be a bad idea to, to miscorrect a read. Um, this turns out to be the flip side of the coin from variant calling. If you can decide that something is an error, is not an error, that it's a true mismatch, then the same thing as calling variants. So we've been developing an approach where we can walk through uh, two, we can walk through a bunch of reads and automatically recover, for example, the unknown haplotypes from, uh, uh, that are present in the original population from those reads without having a reference genome. For human, we have a reference genome, but read mapping is a little squirrely. Um, and so here we're actually hoping to do reference-free variant calling and then go back to the, the human genome to point out where these variants are to give the variants context. And the nice thing about this is it's single pass, it's reference-free, it's tunable. You can say I'm looking at a diploid population or a 1 in 10 population or I want this level of sensitivity. It's streaming and it's online. I didn't say that already. So it means that it's sort of um, it's very it's it's about as efficient as you can have an algorithm be. Uh, and this was recently funded. The actual I, I didn't say this. Michelle didn't say this up, up front. But all of my uh, all of my my single PI grants, the text is fully available online, including the ones that have been rejected. Uh, so if you're more interested in this topic, um, I sold it to the NIH, uh, and uh, you can go read that grant. If you're interested. So um, after the, the little session before this, I just wanted to say, um, since it seems like at least a number of you work on uh, uh, cancer, um, we know something's coming. We're going to be sequencing single cells from tumors. Our goal is to reconstruct the driver, the driver mutations in the, uh, in the tumors in the face of past mutations. So you're looking for sort of phylogeny mutations within a, a complex mixture of tumor cells. And the problem with this is that if you do individual cell sequencing, so you're doing 1,000 cells, each requiring three gigabases, each having, let's say, a half human genome in it. And you need 20x coverage of those. You're talking about 60 terabase pairs of sequence. That's a lot of sequence. It's going to take a long time to compute on that. Uh, and the problem is most of this data will actually not be very interesting. Right? It's going to match the human genome exactly. You can get rid of all that data. So you can view our streaming lossy compression, our streaming approaches, essentially saying, you know what, this read is really uninteresting. If we can do that really efficiently, we can decrease the data set size to something that's much easier to compute upon and provide maybe provide informational guarantees as to what's left in the data set versus what's, what's not there. Uh, so this is like a three-year, this is you know, a three-years project, not a tomorrow project. But we know that this kind of data is coming, so it's worth planning for. Um, so I'll just finish up with, with the comment. So there's this concept called novelty squared. There's a great post by Josh Tulum on this. So in the biological sciences in particular, but across all of science more generally, um, it's very hard to publish novel, it's very hard to publish software. You have to publish that you did something novel at the algorithmic level, and then you have to show those pesky scientists that it actually, that you run it on real interesting novel data and produce interesting results. That's one of the reasons why a typical bioinformatics paper approach is, we wrote a new piece of software, then we found somebody to sequence something for us, and we ran the software and, and, and got a, a nifty result. This is called the novelty squared problem because you have to have squared amounts of novelty. We're now facing the, the novelty cubed problem, which is that we want to develop and maintain a really strong core set of functionality for our research software, which we think is yet another novel approach that we don't know how to sell to people, actually. 
but we'd, we'd like to make it a requirement, actually, for research software. So maybe we could swap out the novel data for good software engineering and keep it novelty squared. I don't know. Um, reproducibility. So this is a, a citation that I stole from somebody on Twitter. So, so we've known for um, millennia that, science, that the scientific approach requires, that, that good scientific approach, uh, approaches require that things be reproducible. It's, it's, maybe it's a weak requirement. Aristotle knew this, right? And as you can see, he published in Nature, so it's a very old journal. Um, and um, it's been a problem in computational science, in computational biology in particular, that it's been very hard to reproduce what people have published in papers. And so all of our papers now have their source hosted on GitHub, data hosted there or on Amazon Web Services. The long-running data analysis that two to two days, three week, three weeks, whatever, can be run with a single make command after installing all the necessary software. And then all of the figures and data digestion that's done for our paper are done in IPython notebook. And that's what this is here on the, on the right. It's an IPython notebook from our camera counting paper. And so anybody, including our reviewers, can in theory reproduce our entire data analysis from scratch with only a few commands. Um, and uh, I know that a few reviewers have done this, and some of them have failed, and some of them have succeeded. And we're working on the ones that have failed. Not the reviewers, the, the papers. <laughs> uh, OK, so some concluding thoughts. So um, when we started comparing Kamer counters, you know, it turns out that there's been an explosion in Kamer counting approaches. And I told you, at the very beginning of this talk, I told you all of our, our cool, nifty stuff is based on the fact that we have a low memory Kamer counter, which lets us do low memory to brain graph storage. Everything that we're doing is based on, on our ability to do that. Um, there's a lot of camera counting approaches out there now. Some of them are better than ours in various ways, but because we built a library with an API that let us do online camera counting, we could very quickly try out new algorithms and new approaches without really a lot of, of, of messing around with source code. And this let us do um, a lot of nifty things. Uh, we were also told very early on, I was told by several people that I should not work on anything that I just told you about because the big sequencing centers were already doing all the engineering necessary to scale their, their software to the next generation of Illumina. I don't think that anybody saw the, the growth in Illumina coming, in the Illumina sequencing coming. And you know there's rumors, again, I should probably not say this in front of her, there's rumors that Illumina has like another tenfold increase in sequencing capacity just waiting for a competitor to come along, right? Oh, how cute, Manipore, here, have another 10 terabases of sequence, right? So um, uh, engineering optimization, increasing our source code's uh, ability by a factor of two to deal with these problems would have resulted in us just falling slightly slower behind. Uh, and so instead, we actually took a more theoretical approach to trying to figure out what the core of the problem was, which in this case is this, this abundant with the normalization approach deals with. Um, and uh, we chose to tackle a harder problem. And it turns out that if you make any progress at all on these hard problems, that um, it's better respected, I guess, by the granting agencies, at least, than making lots of progress on the easy problems. And that, uh, maybe that's a bad thing. I don't know. But, but it, I, I definitely, my new advice to all uh, uh, my postdocs going to faculty positions is um, to, to really try and figure out what the nut of the problem is, that's something that you're going to solve in five years, as opposed to looking for just getting papers out. And then um, a last point, testing lets us scale development, our development, and our, our general process. When something does work, and it's pretty rare that things work right out of the box for us, right? We try something, we get some new data, we try something new to it, and it takes us six months to figure it out. But when it does work, we can just proceed with confidence because our back is covered because our software has a lot of these automated tests. And I think that's our, our not so secret sauce. That's really what lets us try. I get a new graduate student in the lab, and I, I can know fairly quickly whether they're their code is a big problem or a small problem in terms of breaking things that have gone on before. We're moving towards the case where we actually just run all of our papers every time we make a new release of our software, because we can, uh, which lets us make sure that the paper we wrote three years ago is still uh, reproducible. Some caveats. Um, uh, at PyCon, you know, I had a number of graduate students come up and say, oh, it's great. You know, I really want to try and sell um, some advisor on how we should be doing better software development. I say, don't try, don't even try. And the problem is um, that you can spend an infinite amount of time um, on what's called yak shaving. Things that down the road are going to improve your productivity. There's a story, Google it. Anyway, that, that down the road, there are things that can improve your productivity. And if you do them, graduate students are great at avoiding doing their actual work and going and doing things that they think they can justify to themselves because it's more fun. And uh, um, you can spend an infinite amount of time doing that. 
Um, and my advice is really to pick the techniques you're going to tackle, you're going to use based on what your actual pain points are. So I noticed a lot of my scripts were failing, so I invested in automated testing. I didn't have continuous integration at the time. Um, and, and there's a list of these things in best practices in scientific computing, which is a paper that just came out very well soon. And others. Um, we have found that funders and reviewers just don't care about good software practices. That's sort of a 90, 95% statement. Um, the, my advice is to briefly drop the mention that you're using GitHub, that you're using automated testing, that you're using continuous integration, whatever it is you're using, in grants and papers. And the reviewers that care about that will flag it and go, okay. And the reviewers that don't care about it won't get hung up on it. Why are they wasting their time doing this? Why is there a chunk of text in here that I don't understand, et cetera? And then it turns out that advisors really just don't care because it, because it doesn't matter to funders and reviewers. Advisors really tend not to care about this stuff either. And that's, these are all sort of 90% true statements. So, um, I would argue those are changing, though. I, I think they are changing, but but you know, before you rush, before the graduate students in the room rush off to their advisor excitedly and tell them that I have now said blessed an immense amount of work on infrastructure, just I will not back you up. This is a fight you cannot win yet. Maybe you can go. Maybe you can reference. That's right. Um, so last, sorry, I'm getting a little bit over. So, so there's this great quote. So this is, if you haven't gone and read the Science Web, I don't know who's behind it, but it is a brilliant blog. Um, so I'm just going to read the quote. So uh, this, this post was on, bioinformatics software companies have no clue why no one buys their products. And the quote is, it's as if somewhere out there is a collection of totally free software that can do a far better job than ours can, with open published methods, great support networks, and fantastic tutorials. But that's madness. Who on earth would create such an amazing resource? For those of you that have looked for bioinformatics help online, this describes what you find. There are a number of sites, Seek Answers and Biostars are the two that I would most refer you to, but Twitter and blogs, where you can find all the information you want that hasn't yet made it into published papers. And the authors are incredibly helpful and friendly about this stuff in general. And uh, um, I really want to take advantage of this and start building these protocols out and start making this more and more explicit so that nobody ever has to do, has to run a complicated metagenome assembly pipeline for the first time after making it up from scratch, right? Go ahead and innovate as you need once you have finished something. But, but, anyway. So, um, and with that, I'll just say thank you. The talk's up on SlideShare. Feel free to email me, or probably better at this point, tweet me, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for listening. So the, the reproducible software and reviewers not caring, um, you know, editorial standards have improved over the past couple of decades in a number of, number of ways in terms of you know, requiring people to deposit data, adhere to certain standards like Miami or you know, now nature is adding this reproducibility checklist. What can we add to make sure that people are publishing software that actually runs because as a reviewer, I usually try to run the software, and um, you know, it usually never runs. And usually, the other two reviewers don't say anything about that because they didn't try to download the software. Yeah. So you're right. Most people, most people at the review stage don't seem to don't seem to care, but I think they should. Right. And it's now 33 percent instead of 10 percent. Well, there's an ascertainment bias there. I don't see <laughs> so, so um, I have two two thoughts. So I got in a fight. Like, an argument of Hilmar Lapp, who's, I guess he's a PLOS bio, PLOS comp bio editor uh, at, at um, a conference a year and a half ago, where I said, you know, we should have a checklist. Like, you get a, a checklist for software reviews. Like, you get the software, and like, can you download it? Can you compile it? Can you run it? Is there test data? Can I download, you know, whatever. And Hilmar, Hilmar made a point that I think he's right about. Don't tell him I said that, but, but that I think he's right about, where he said, look, the problem is that there's a wide spectrum of bioinformatics papers. And having a one-size-fits-all approach, even though the dogmatic people like me might think that the one-size-fits-all approach might actually fit all, in practice, we should figure out what good practices are and then encode them in, in checklists. And, 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 and I don't think we actually know what best practices are. I mean, it would obviously be crazy for me to say, look, I need to be able to reproduce your paper from scratch with an IPython notebook. Not every program is in Python. Some papers involve wet bench work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think that the community consensus building approach is the right way to go. On the flip side, I'm sure you caught the PLOS one, uh, all your data must be available. Kerfuffle, I don't know how many people in the room saw. There were howls of protest. PLOS one said, we're just going to require everybody to deposit to, to make their data available for the paper before we even consider the paper. 
And everybody said, but that sounds hard. I mean, that was essentially what a lot of it. There was a few good points made. There, there were a few good points made, but a lot of it was just like, oh my god, an extra step. And if you publish the papers, papers are a lot of work. But I, I sort of sympathize, but not that much, with, with the idea that extra steps are, are frustrating. So I think we have a ways to go would be my, and I don't think it's all bad that we have a ways to go. I think there's some good points. So really what I want to have happen is more people like you get to the point where you're viewing more papers and rejecting them because you can't run the software. Because that will fix it faster than anything else. If you can't get a paper published or a grant funded, Yeah, do more papers. Yeah. So, with respect to um, uh, peer review and uh, sort of actually uh, tenure review and yeah. so forth, and you publicate in the journals you publish in and so forth, are you now on on the so the next? I guess, are you saying publish everything in plus one and, and then uh, that will that will be it's out there it's in a peer review format and that's yeah. good enough or do you? Or but you mentioned a PNAS paper, and you mentioned yeah. So I have two PNAS papers, so I cheated. Yes. Um, and uh, but it's two co-authors' fault, right? No, no. <laughs> um, I chose I chose PNAS because um, to apply to because it had an open access option, so I, I wouldn't compromise on the open access. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the, my approach to that, and and I am, I was successful enough with grants that I was less worried about the publication aspect, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right? Um, so I thought I could get away with it a little bit. Uh, my approach is to say, look, in my CV I put the citation numbers, and I know that my papers are getting I are being my software is being used because my papers, including my preprints, are being cited. And I, I can't think of a reasonable tenure review committee. We can debate that term yeah. in a sec, but I can't think of a reasonable tenure review committee that would say, because this paper is published in Plus One, even though it has a hundred citations in two years, we're going to discount it. So that's been my strategy. I'll let yeah. you know. No, but you. But also, but you. You're also opposing to archive. It's so a pre-publication. Yeah. So preprints, right? Yeah. So yeah. preprints. Are those are those going to pass that test? So it turns out, and uh, so I asked this. Uh, yeah. um, it turns out computer science didn't know what to do with them. But I'm in a microbiology department, and the College of Natural Science said physicists and mathematicians do this all the time. Yeah. In physics and math, it's it's sort of day rigor. You post your yeah. paper to, to archive. Yeah. And so they had no problem with it. So I think I think um, you know every every conversation between academics boils down to grants and tenure, right? So uh, grants, pubs, and tenure. Um, but I think that what I'm seeing is that the external letters are what a lot of things sort of hinge on. If the external letters say, "Yeah, this guy, sure, this guy published in Plus One, but hold, but he, he made a he made an impact," that's going to count more than where the things published. Equivalently, if you publish eight papers in science and the comments are all of the, this guy's a doofus, I don't know how he got his papers into science, I don't think that's going to go very well for you. It might, might go well, it depends on how much grant money you brought in. But anyway, so, so I think it's, it's very, the, the value that we have in the, in the U.S. at any rate, and I realize I'm not in the U.S. But, um, right now, but the value we have in the U.S. is that these, these review committees are actually fairly flexible as far as I can tell in terms of what they're going to consider. But I don't know, I'll let you know. In, a year or so. Well, many of us review in the U.S. too. We live here. <laughs> okay, can, I'll take the last question from Mark, and then we'll take all of the conversation to to the pizza, which is cool. <laughs> um, so I want to play devil's advocate. Sure. At the end of the talk, you were giving us take-home messages, you know, yeah. career advice, that kind of stuff. And what really struck me was you said, "Hey, I got all these great things going on, and everybody told me they wouldn't work." Yep. So I think one take-home message is. Don't listen to anything and you'll be a success. So why shouldn't you listen to you? <laughs> <laughs> don't don't, don't so listen to anyone and you, I'm going to say you're a success. So, so one take home message is don't listen to anybody and you'll be a success. So why should we listen to you? So that's, that works for certain people. <laughs> and I'm not sure that it works. And it works, you know, I was in, I, uh, I came from outside, I mean, I lucked into a number of things. So I think I was quite lucky in a number of ways. Um, and things could have gone quite differently. Uh, so what I worry about is I'm not sure, I, I try to back away from giving general advice because I have no evidence that, that this will work for anybody else. I twisted your words. Yeah, no, I know. But, but so, so I guess what I would say is if you have a strong vision, I mean, my attitude was if this isn't going to work, I'll go do something else, right? That's not the attitude that a lot of assistant professors come into the game with. Um, and, uh, you know, I had a background in open source, a background in industry, a background in startups. Um, I've, I've skipped around among five, I've published in four different disciplines. So I was like, well, we'll see what happens. 
I also came out of Cal I also came out of some big labs, and my pedigree is is good, which apparently matters. So, so you know, all of these things they worked for me, but I hesitate to say, look, write a lot of blog posts. It'll help you because, you know, I haven't published that much. I have two, I think I have two senior author papers, five six years in. Right? That's kind of not great. I have another like five on the way, but but hopefully those will come out for my tenure review. That'll be a problem. So I. It's very hard to generalize, this is what I would, I guess I would say. So I don't want people taking this and going, well, Titus said it would work out for me, and then they'll wait for me in a dark alleyway in five years. <laughs> so that's, my, that's my concern. My experience in, in, at the wet lab was that I could always find people that could tell me my ideas were important, and that really not listening to them was often important, because sometimes my stuff would work. But and you have really, tenure, right? No. <laughs> I didn't get tenure. I, but uh, no, but I'm thinking about when I'm supposed to Okay. There's like there's lots of people with opinions, and I'll tell you, that's not going to work. Don't waste your time on that. Don't, don't, you know, it's not safe. But yeah. You can't always listen to those. Good point. Please join me in thanking Titus again. <laughs> <laughs>